Everybody can you hear me? Yeah. I said to I said to Ian that um, I'm going to look like Ian or Trevor or Britney Spears with this thing on. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for everyone coming. And um, yeah, I'll just be uh, a little bit gracious. I might be stretching all over the place. I'm just trying to get uh, a little bit of more oxygen into my lungs. What do you really believe? Meg and I met, and we were both strong Christians, pursuing a life after Christ. We had key scriptures in our lives at that time. Matthew 6.33 was for me. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. And for Meg, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding, in all of your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll direct your paths. We started dating with a plan to get married and live sold out for the Lord. Ian Ray did our pre-marriage counseling, and we were married at the end of 2011. It was an epic day. We've had a fantastic marriage, um, and we've been blessed with three superb kids. Uh, this was our last family holiday before my accident. Uh, in October 2021, I went up to Zambezi River uh, for a work fishing comp. Um, it, um, it was lots of fun. We um, had a, a really um, great and warm day of fishing. Um, and at the end of that day, we got off the water at about 5.30. And I came up to... Um, I came up uh, to our room and got changed, put my glasses down, and headed over to the pool. I can remember everything about my accident, just like it was yesterday, every detail. And um, yeah, I've got two pictures just to give you a little bit of reference, because people always wonder how the heck I managed to do it. Um, so this is my brother's kindly displaying it. My brother Peter is where I was standing. And yes, it is extremely shallow where my brother Bill is. And it looks obvious because there's a set of stairs there, but for some reason, there's stairs on both sides of this pool, and for some reason, I just assumed that the other side was the, sh was the shallow end. So I dived from where Peter is, and I landed basically where Bill is. Bill also did an illustration doing a handstand, but I thought it wouldn't be appropriate for them. <laughs> also, for reference to the story, the people who haven't been to Tiger Safaris, uh, this is the pool where Meg and I, where, where I'm sitting, and Meg's taking the photo, and the restaurant uh, is where my colleague Clement was sitting, and you can get an idea of the distance between the two. There was also a lounge suite, an outdoor lounge suite, uh, on the lawn between the two. Sorry. So, walked up to the pool, I climbed up that rock fountain, it was obviously a super stupid decision, but I dived, and I think I dived really badly. I pretty much dived vertically. I think I took a stroke as I hit the water, and like instantly, my head, right on the top of my head, to give me an idea of how vertical I was, smacked the bottom of the pool, and I heard this big <coughs> and a whole lot of blood came out both my nostrils. You know how blood weirdly diffuses into water? And I thought, flip, I've done something. And, and then the next thing I noticed, I just couldn't swim at all. Um, Megs uh, has been very involved in teaching our kids swimming, and she always says to them, just do a starfish when you're not sure. And I felt the Lord said, well, I felt, I just got this impression to do a starfish. So I held my breath, I've always been very good at holding my breath, and uh, managed to get eventually to the surface, and I knew that Clement was sitting where he was sitting, and I thought, I've just got to get a, no a loud enough yell, and I'll be, able to, I'll be able to get his attention. Bearing in mind, I had no idea what was going on. I just couldn't swim. Eventually, I got to the surface, and I yelled as loud as I could. And I just had this help come out my mouth. And I was like, what is going on? He is never going to hear that. I was totally confused. I went below the surface again. I was like, Tom, you're definitely going to have to shout again. And this time, shout. And I got to the surface a second time. 
I yelled with all my might, help. And I just thought, there is no plan. This guy is just never going to hear me. I sunk below the surface and I thought I probably could get there a third time. I've tried this subsequently and it is really difficult to do. I actually don't know how it happened. Uh, I managed to get to the surface a third time and that help was a very small help. I left the surface and I thought it's pretty much not possible that he's heard me. And I knew I wasn't going to be able to get to the surface again. And I, I just started praying. Um, yeah, I, I, I wasn't drowning. I wasn't yet drowning. I still, I, I hadn't started drinking water or anything like that. And I saw Clement walking towards the pool and I thought, oh my hat, I'm not going to drown. Anyway, Clement saw me in the pool and God bless his soul, he was super casual. Uh, he walked up to the pool, took his shirt off. I could kind of see through the water, thinking to myself, get in the pool, get in the pool, get in the pool. From his perspective, he had been sitting messaging his wife and he th thought he had heard a kid um, asking for help. And he was like, this is an all men's fishing competition, there's no children here. He only heard two helps. And on the second help, he was like, no man, that's definitely, definitely, definitely a kid shouting for help. So he had gotten up. He took his wallet out, took his phone out, uh, stepped into the pool. And um, um, quick side story, my boy Sam, when I went to Target Safari's this most recent trip, he said to me, Dad, don't forget to step in the pool before you dive in. <laughs> Clement stepped into the pool, came across to me, grabbed me, picked me out of the water and was like, Tom, what is going on? I said, Clement, I don't know what's happened, but something bad's happened. I've broken something. Please just hold my neck. I, I think I've broken my neck. And, um, yeah, I, uh, he, he was now holding my neck, and, and I was like, I think you better call for some help. And he yelled for help for an age before someone came. And uh, I, just, I was just struck that if he had, hadn't been there, I just wouldn't have been able to survive. Um, my brother Bill came into the pool. There were quite a few people there. And my brother Bill, when we were growing up, had this excellent technique of inflicting pain by my knee. And I said to him, Bill, I can't feel anything. And I remember him grabbing my knee and digging his finger in. And me looking at him and him looking at me and both of us realizing this is excruciating and you can't feel it. And then he gave it his all and I still couldn't feel it. And he was like, okay, shuck, something's wrong. Anyway, Rob Davey was there. He uh, was trained as a first uh, responder, I think you call it. And it was fantastic to have someone just super confident on what to do. He arrived at the pool and was like, okay, guys, we're going to do A, B, C, and D. They managed to take a door off, I think, a bedroom. I'm not so sure. They put the door into the pool, strapped me to the door. I think they used some motorbike straps. But they did an exceptionally good job, and I was really grateful to Rob Davey. Um, on the side of the pool, sorry, on the side of the pool, I managed to get an opportunity to chat to Meg. And, um, yeah, it was this weird feeling I, uh, on the phone, sorry. Um, I, I was feeling totally fine, but I was also feeling like, oh my hat, I don't know if I'm going to make it. They managed to put me into a big SUV, and then uh, we drove off to Makuti where we had organized an ambulance to meet me. That's Peter's legs. He's become very good at um, being with me in ambulances. Um, I was so relieved to be off the door. I don't know if any of you have noticed, but I've got this little spot in the back of my head without any hair. And that was just from this pressure sore from just being on that door for those few hours. And I was grateful to be on a proper spinal board, but most of all, I was really grateful to be on oxygen. I, um, uh, your, your, your spinal cord runs everything, you learn but uh, your intercostal muscles are very important in breathing, and I didn't have those. I just was really struggling to get enough oxygen into my head. My blood pressures were off the charts low, and eventually, by the time we got to Harare, we were on the maximum oxygen, and I kept asking them for more. I was in absolutely no pain, and although I felt like my body was beginning to slowly shut down, I had a fully clear mind. I kept thinking to myself, it was totally miraculous that I did not drown. God must have been there. It's going to be fine. 
when I'd been on the side of the pool, I had said, I had said to Meg some last words, and I was now oscillating between that weird feeling of like, oh my hat, am I going to get to Rory and be totally fine? And then that weird embarrassment of like, Flip Tom was totally fine, we organized an ambulance and all this stress. Or am I just not going to make it to town? It was a weird feeling. I remember saying to God, if I do survive, Lord, I would like three things. I'd like to glorify you with the rest of my life. I'd like to leave behind the sin of the world. And I'd like to have no fear of man. As the last two of these had really plagued my life. I have come to learn that we will have to deal with the sin of the world until we are with him in heaven, which is annoying. <laughs> and that the only way to not fear man is to fear God more. Meg, do you want to read that for us? Um, Matthew 10, verse 28. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So, um, sorry, excuse the spasms. Um, I eventually arrived at hospital uh, some hours later, and Meg is going to carry on from there. So Tom arrived at around one in the morning, and Trish had been rallying around, yeah, organizing his arrival at Milton Park, and we were both waiting for him there. Um, it took a while to get him out the ambulance and into hospital, and we waited for a doctor to come and check him out and um, she confirmed that he did probably have a spinal cord injury given his movement and um, and then it, it just felt like that whole night everything just took so long but I think at around half past three, four we finally managed to go to get a CT scan and MRI at the Imaging Diagnostic Centre um, and that was getting Tom back into the ambulance and another drive and all fairly anxious time um, watching his blood pressure and his oxygen. And um, we got there, he had a CT scan and they confirmed he had broken his neck. Um, given that the lady in charge thought it was best that we didn't try and move him out of his spinal board into the MRI machine because that was quite a lot of movement um, for his neck. However, the surgeon said he wouldn't want to operate without the MRI. Um, so we had to get the MRI if he was going to be operated on the next day. And so um, it was a... Yeah, I, I felt extremely distressed and out of control. Um, I didn't have great faith in the medical staff. I, they were just ambulance guys, and, and I was wishing for someone to come and <laughs> just help take charge. Um, anyway, between, Tom was still fully cognizant, and between us, we decided no, we'd, we'd, we'd put him in the MRI. Um, and he was anxious that he wasn't going to make it because he couldn't have oxygen in the MRI machine. And so. I think just before we went in, I called Doug and Chloe, feeling just desperate for <laughs> assistance. And um, we went in for the MRI. After 20 minutes, the machine broke down. And um, yeah, I, that 20 minutes, I just, it's very loud, an MRI machine. <laughs> I just sat there in the corner praying for Tom that he was going to make it. Um, and then when it broke down, my heart was just like, <laughs> we're going to have to go through this whole thing again because they're going to have to start over. Um, anyway, he went back out, got more oxygen while they tried to fix the machine, at which time Doug and Chloe arrived. Um, Chloe was pregnant, so she couldn't come back in with the, machi the, the MRIs. Yeah, it was about 3.30 in the morning, maybe 4. Um, so Doug came in with me, and just the relief to see Doug and, and have that responsibility shared, <laughs> responsibility for Tom's life, that's what it felt like. Um, and he just sat with us and prayed for Tom, and I just had so much more peace um, sharing it. Um, and I think that was probably the darkest in the whole of Tom's accident time. 
uh, that was definitely the darkest time for me when I look back. And yeah, since then, um, all of our friends have been absolutely amazing. Um, even Dan Bowler fixing <laughs> Tom's wheelchair last weekend. Um, but family as well, um, Bob making the standing frame, uh, Peter always there helping us with all our uh, tasks that I can't do. Um, and Bill is yeah, always supporting and Trish always organizing everything and <laughs> behind the scenes. Um, so I, and my family as well, taking care of my kids and, and flying to Cape Town to be with me. And I, in this time, I've just absolutely um, valued our family and our friendships. Um, and I was so glad that we had those deep relationships um, that, that in our time of need, we just had people we could completely trust. Um, and it's just so worth investing in relationships. Okay. Is my mic working? Okay, cool, sorry. Um, so yeah, came out the MRI. This was the MRI result. Um, I survived the MRI, which I was super gracial, grateful for, um, but I had broken uh, five, six, and seven, which is kind of here in your neck, and my spinal cord had been damaged. Uh, theater was booked for 9 a.m. that morning, and uh, they needed to decompress my cord and then remove the crushed bones with a, with a cadaver bone. Uh, when I got to theater, I, uh, I remember being wheeled in. You're in this like super, super, super confined uh, spinal board, and I could just see this, the biggest spotlight I've ever seen. And um, this guy with an American bandana leant over and said, how's it? And I said, hi. He's like, I'm your anesthetist. I was like, OK. He was like, you ready to go under? I said, yes. And I started praying pretty much twice as hard. This guy looked <laughs> 35 and ultra cool. Um, but they were a fantastic team, and uh, they did a really good job. So they basically put a plate in there, uh, two screws at the top and the bottom, and then one to hold the cadaver bone in place. I came out of theatre around 4 p.m. that day, um, and the next two or three days I don't have any recollection of. Uh, I just well, the parts that I do remember, it was really painful. They go through the front, so they have to move your throat, and it's just really, really sore uh, to try and swallow and drink. But I was basically away with the fairies for those three days. Uh, during my time in high care, um, I met Laurie Marks, and he was an absolute godsend. Um, he asked if he could take me on as his patient and become my anaesthetist, uh, to which I gladly obliged, and he organized all the paperwork and got me transferred. And these guys were super duper busy. Milton Park is hectic. But every single day, sometimes twice a day, Laurie would make the time to come and sit next to my bed and chat with me just to check in on how I was doing and see if there was anything he could help with. It was an invaluable quality time for me as visitors were so restricted by the COVID regulations and the COVID regulations throughout my time in hospital in hindsight were just totally stupid but they were just really stringent. Laurie used to sit on the side of my bed and uh, I don't know who, if, how many people have met him here but he's an amazing person. And uh, he would just say to me, Tom, it's just one day at a time. You've got to take this thing one day at a time. God gives us strength just for the day, one day at a time. And he also said that God would provide, God would provide me with someone throughout the process to be there for me. And this proved to be really true. Be it a nurse, a roommate, a rehab therapist, I felt God's hand through certain people throughout my three months in hospital. I was then moved to a private room and my neurosurgeon Valentine performed some tests to give me my initial diagnosis. I was given a score of one out of two for sensation and zero out of two for motor function. And I remember thinking to myself, those are horrendously like vague scores. Um, but basically, this part of my neck controls pretty much from here down and I had some feeling and sensation, but no capacity to move anything. Um, I asked him the question which I subsequently asked pretty much every specialist that I met. How bad is it, Dr. Valentine? 
do you think I'm going to be able to walk again? And these questions were always super tough to ask. He said to me, Tom, it's important that you accept where you're at and pray and trust God for healing. He is the creator and he is able, but you must accept the current situation. That's him. He's a brilliant surgeon. And from my experience with him, he's totally kingdom focused. Around this time, Meg arranged for the kids uh, to be able to visit me for the first time. It was a hectic experience, um, but man, I really, really love these kids. I now had more time to think, um, and I really begun thinking. I was amazed at how my brain could think of so many scenarios all at the same time. What does this mean? What are the consequences? How long is it going to take for me to get better? How are we going to deal with it? What are we going to do about work? How are the kids going to manage? And in conjunction with these questions were the bigger ones, which is, is Meg going to stick around? Surely, and this is the truth, this is how you think, but this is certainly how I thought, surely it's going to be better for both of us if she moves on. Bear in mind, at this point in time, I was la lying on a fancy pneumatic mattress that would inflate different cells at different times, being turned by, by nursing staff every three hours to prevent pressure sores. I had big compression airbags on my legs to assist with circulation. I was constantly plugged into a drip through my chest going to my heart. I could not feed myself or even get my backrest into a seating position without passing out. I was passing stool in bed, which is an incredibly humbling experience. I was being bed bathed, which is a lot better than not being bed bathed, but um, it's just not the same as showering yourself. I had someone else brushing my teeth, which is an incredibly awkward experience, which I'd encourage you to try. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I had physios every day trying to get me to move various parts of my body which were moving in my head, but just for the life of me would not move in real life. And they still move. I can move all my limbs. In my head, they're moving. Um, and I would watch them inject my leg with blood thinners every day, and every new nurse would say to me, I'm very sorry, sir, this is going to hurt quite a bit. And I would say to them, don't worry, ma'am, I don't think I'm going to be able to feel it. We also had no timeline or concept of how long this was going to take, and how long it would be until I got better. It just felt super dismal. I would like to say that I knew God was with me throughout the process and I knew He wasn't going to leave me nor forsake me. But I was finding it really difficult to understand. I could not think of how I was going to cope without Meg, even though I really did not want Meg to have to cope with it. Unbeknownst to me, Meg was anxious that even though, oh sorry, Meg was anxious that under the current circumstances I've described, I was going to try and commit suicide. Around the time of her birthday, we managed to hash it out. Tom, if you stick around, I will stick around. And referring to her vows, she quoted a book that we liked from Dr. Zeus. I meant what I said, and I said what I meant. I will be faithful 100%. So help me God. And subsequently, she put that on a poster and put it on my wall. And oh boy, has Meg been faithful, 100%. She's been unbelievable. Um, yeah. Mesa, Meg also likes me to tell people that she's not perfect and wouldn't like to be put on a pedestal because she wouldn't enjoy falling off. <laughs> I knew the Lord was with me. Meg was committed to being by my side. And although I often doubted this, or sometimes doubted this, she continued to reaffirm me throughout the process. In terms of faith, Meg and I really wanted to be on the same page uh, in those kinds of environments. Like I didn't have many visitors, but I had thousands of messages and phone calls, which I was mega grateful for. But you just begin to realize that everyone's, there's lots of different views and thoughts and ways of looking at it. And we wanted to be on the same page going into the next phase of recovery. Meg and I agreed, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we would trust God to heal and deliver me. 
But that if I was not healed, we would not turn away from God. We would continue to serve Him and glorify Him. And that's why we're sharing our testimony today. Do you mind reading for me, Megs? Daniel 3, verse 16 to 28. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. We now began preparing to go to the rehab facility. There were many decisions that needed to be made, some of which we had no clue about. I'm like the polar opposite of knowing anything about medical stuff. I now know a fair bit. And the Lord was really faithful in giving us confidence in choosing. Meg toiled over this time with sleepless nights, concerned kids, hospital visits, and a considerable amount of admin, which is not her strength. We received the final authorization for my flight to Cape Town six hours before we flew. And our friends were enormously supportive during this time. One story worth sharing is that we needed affidavits signed um, for the kids to be able to travel to South Africa without me. But as I couldn't sign, we needed a lawyer to be able to certify these signatures. As I mentioned, COVID rules were super stringent and they were allowing one visit a day for one hour and they were strict. Once again, we called on Doug's services. He arrived at the hospital at Milton Park and confidently just cruised through that entrance foyer, turned right down my ward section, past a nursing station. And as he strode past there, a nurse said to him, oh, good evening, doctor, would you like a notepad? <laughs> to which Doug said, oh, no, I'm fine, thank you very much. <laughs> and cruised down into my ward and sorted out all of my paperwork. Hashtag dress code. <laughs> that night, I had an opportunity to chat with Doug about a phone call I'd had with Jason Shaw. Jason, who's been through a fair bit of suffering, had encouraged me to be brave whilst I didn't understand. You just have to be brave, Tom. You just have to be brave. This proved to be extremely helpful advice in the upcoming weeks of trauma. I said to Doug that night, I don't know if I can be this brave, Doug. I just don't think I'm the right guy. I've never been the brave guy. Maybe one of my brothers would manage, but I just don't think I'm the one. It was a super emotional time. I can remember just sobbing with the physio and Doug next to me. But some hours later, Doug left and I was ready to go to rehab in Cape Town. And it was just another testimony of encouragement of friends. And we were off. Uh, the ambulance driver collected me at 4 a.m. that morning and he drove to the airport like I'd just broken my neck. Um, <laughs> which I found hilarious because when we got there, we waited for about an hour and a half for the paperwork to come through from the airport authorities. Um, but it was my first time in the sun and it just felt marvelous. Um, I, can I can vividly remember lying outside the ambulance in the sun and just hoping that it would take longer um, and seeing these two little sparrow fly over and being reminded of that scripture, which I'm going to ask Meg to read. Verse 29 to 31. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls to the ground, apart from your father's will? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. Thanks, Mister. It was a long day in a fairly small aircraft. Once again, Peter was with me and was practicing in case both pilots passed out and had to land. We only arrived in Cape Town at 9 p.m. that night, and my brother was a great support through the process. On arrival at rehab, they could not admit me uh, whilst I was on this highly specialized blood medication, and I was totally gutted. Peter finally managed to talk some sense into me, and I succumbed and was transferred back to ICU. Megs and the kids traveled to Cape Town that same day, and uh, here God provided miraculously once again. And this one's a little bit complicated, so you'd have to just try and listen carefully. Meg's mum's cousin's husband in South Africa told one of his patients 
about our story and that we were going to rehab in Cape Town. This patient told her sister-in-law, Melody, who contacted Meg back through this chain and offered us their stunning holiday home in Constantia and the use of their vehicle. At, at 10 o'clock at night on my birthday. Yes. <laughs> so this was Meg rolling around uh, Cape Town. ICU was super hectic. Uh, it was full, busy and noisy. I had exceptionally good staff, but I was already missing Zimbabweans. We were in a massive hospital and I had three neurosurgeons who would alternate seeing me depending on the day. I asked each of them the standard question over the three days. How bad is it, doctor? Do you think I'm going to be able to walk again? Uh, on the first day, we got the response, I don't know, Tom, but for certain, your life is not going to be the same. On the second day, and this guy ended up being the grim reaper for our time that we were there, he said to me, it is highly unlikely that you're ever going to walk again. And the third neurosurgeon positively said, I might regain the use of my hands. It was a challenge throughout this rehab process to try and balance having faith and seeing reality. It was tough knowing that God knew so much more than these neurosurgeons, that he was intimately aware of exactly how badly damaged my spinal cord was, but simultaneously trying to come to grips with the reality of the situation. It's difficult to describe what rehab is like. Everything is totally new, and I knew nothing about it. I found that every single day of the three months I had a question to ask and almost every day I received more insight into the severity of the injury. My doctor used to say that spinal cord injuries are like an iceberg. You see them from the outside, oh man, that guy can't walk, and it's just this little tip. But once you experience it, you realize just how much more is involved. I was transferred out of ICU into a rehab facility, and for the first few days, they just worked on getting me into a seated position without, having, without me fainting. Eventually, I was able to transfer into a massive wheelchair that they called the Beast, which was basically a bed that was on wheels. Uh, on the first day of actual rehab, I can remember them taking me outside, and I was thinking, right, day one of learning to walk. And uh, bearing in mind, yeah, and they, uh, they got this big colorful ball. Everything in rehab is primary colors. It's really annoying. Um, and they said, OK, Tom, today the two of us are just going to throw this ball, and you're going to pass it back. And I remember thinking, this is totally ridiculous, and then struggling to catch the ball and not being able to throw it back. And the penny dropped. Rehab was going to be a super tough process of learning the most basic skills, which I'd always taken for granted. There were some particularly sorrowful days in rehab. Normally when Dr. Ed would explain more about what he liked to call the package deal of spinal cord injury. He was annoying because he had been a spinal doctor for about 35 years and got to the point where he found some of these things humorous. But he was an excellent doctor, ex Marandera. My therapists were always concerned about the depths of sorrow that I would go to after finding out more bad news about my future. But in those depths, I always found God's peace. And heaven was beginning to look really appealing. Do you mind reading that for me, Megs? Philippians 4, verse 6 to 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Thanks, Megs. Um, this is a bit of a random story, but I'd like to share it. I used to lie in bed and flex this massive left bicep because <laughs> it was the one muscle that I could move and watch it flex. And it was just so relieving to think it's not some brain trauma that I've got that I can't send messages to these muscles. And uh, I thought it was funny how us humans like trusting in our bodies and ourselves, which we can control, but we just do not like trusting in God who created everything, including our bodies. It was yet another challenge for me. What do you believe, Tom? 
If it's that God created everything and sent His Son to die for me so that I could be in relationship with Him and His Holy Spirit lives inside of me, then surely it would be a good idea to trust in Him over this one remaining bicep. I was slowly beginning to realize that God was all that I needed. I was learning to pray just for God's presence and not for anything else. I would believe He was there by faith when I couldn't feel it, and I was asking Him for strength to face each and every day. Laurie Marks. You have lots of time in rehab. I knew exactly how many of those little dots were on each of the um, um, K ceiling boards. Ceiling boards. Uh, you just have lots of time. And I began asking the really difficult questions, some of which I've yet to be able to answer. God, this is super duper hard, and you know because you know me. Surely it's just too much and too hard. God, I know you saved me from the pool, and I believe that was totally miraculous. I'm certain of it, but surely you could have just caught my head a little bit to prevent this damage to my spinal cord. Oh Lord, what I would give and what I would do to be healed. I know that you can heal me instantly and take it away. Oh, please do. COVID rules were super strict in Cape Town and fluctuated from no visiting hours at all. Meg had to send an email to them saying to them, I thank you that you guys are fixing my husband's physical state, but you are totally stuffing up his mental state. From, they fluctuated from no visiting hours to one visit a day from one person for one hour. I only managed to see the kids three times during the two and a half months that I was there, and each time was such a highlight. The first time was really tough as Zoe did not want to come to me, being seriously intimidated by the beast of the wheel, the, the mass of the beast and the neck brace. I now struggled to get it off my lap. Most of our communication was over WhatsApp video calls, and Meg was epic at doing this every evening. But occasionally the nurses would let me through to the north wing, and Meg would risk the guards and bring the kids to the window so that, I could, so that we could see each other. It was always a fantastic break to a mundane day. My second visit from the kids, uh, but this time I had upgraded to a normal wheelchair and, and things were looking up. And that's a good description of how Meg's been throughout this process. <laughs> Not much had changed by now in my daily struggles and routines, except that I was mobile, and that was fantastic. I must say, you look at a wheelchair so positively when you've been in a bed for an age. And the fantastic goodness of the outdoors. To sit outside in the sun was just heavenly. Meg visited me every single day, whether she was allowed or whether we had to do it through the glass. And this glass was double glazed. You could shout at each other, not hear each other. So we used to have a WhatsApp video call, I mean a WhatsApp call going whilst we were chatting. And there was always a lip sync issue, which Meg struggles with. Meg and I had our 10-year anniversary whilst in COVID lockdown and uh, Meg's cooked a super amazing dinner and there was always a bit of tricks to how the, this setup worked. There was north wing, south wing, east wing and the guards hung around certain places and you were allowed to drop off meals. So Meg came in, dropped off the meal and said, I'd just like to drop this for my husband and then proceeded to basically leave and then legged it around the north end <laughs> with a camping chair set this little dinner up, and we had our anniversary through the glass. It was awesome. Uh, it unfortunately didn't last very long because she was spotted by one of the patrolling guards <laughs> and had to get removed from the property. <laughs> Rehab was a tedious process of tiny, inconsequential gains that move you towards independence. Basically, the rehab therapists, their goal is to just become, is to just get you independent. You think they're trying to get you to walk, but they sly dogs, and they're just getting you independent. There are, however, many things that I'm deeply grateful to God for. This list was over 100, and I've just culled it to five. I'm a very fortunate quadriplegic. I've made friends with a quad in rehab, and he had no use of his arms, and that's just a whole new level. I've had no pain since I left ICU, none at all, which is abnormal for patients in a, in a chair. I can feel light and deep pressure below my injury. I just can't feel pain and temperature. But, the, but feeling the pressure makes a huge difference. And I have a thing called proprioception, which means I can know where my muscles are, where my body's. If I close my eyes, I know where I am at, 
which helps your balance and gives you much greater independence. I don't have a condition called autonomic dysreflexia, which is a terrible condition that some patients get. My left thumb um, began to work when I got home, and that's massively improved my independence, uh, allowing me to catheter myself, as well as doing suppositories when Megs is not around. I'm incredibly grateful to God for these in seemingly insignificantly, seemingly insignificant, but just totally life-changing blessings. My therapists were fantastic, and I take my hat off to them for their patience, perseverance, courage, and determination. And shout, shout out to Pam Henderson, who's on the far right. She's a brilliant Zimbabwean physio. And to Debbie for her pool. Next up. <coughs> So we had initially booked Tom in for 12 weeks, weeks of rehab, um, but after eight weeks, um, after all he's described, you can imagine he was absolutely over it. He had also had COVID for, I think it was 10 days, and was in complete isolation for those 10 days, not in a room on his own, not even other patients with him. Um, and he was just missing friends and family being around him to support him. So he was desperate to get out. Um, he was learning a lot, though, and making a lot of vital progress. So we managed to get him out at 10 weeks instead of 12, and we had two more weeks in Cape Town um, just learning our new life together. Um, so on our first, I took Tom out, checked him out at like 10 in the morning, and we went out for lunch at the waterfront. And it was just magical to be together and felt so normal and it was such a high. But we got home to discover his new wheelchair had given him a minor pressure sore on his back. And it just went from high to low. And um, for someone like Tom, and a, a wheelchair is their freedom. And we were going into day two with no wheelchair. And it was a Sunday morning the, the following day and we were staying with a wonderful lady called Amory, who's super organized. And she left at seven in the morning to find some high density foam. And between Tom and Amory and myself, we made a plan to take the pressure off the area on his back and we fixed up his wheelchair. And I felt like it was such a, a God's provision in finding that high density foam from a gym shop that was open. Um, and that foam remained until his, in that chair like it was until <laughs> until he got his new chair. Um, yeah, but that two weeks was hard. I was learning um, how to manage blood and bowel, how to manage Tom's temperature. There were some really hot days, and he actually pretty much passed out in a restaurant. We had friends miraculously there who helped us in that time, a doctor. Um, so that was really scary. Tom fell backwards and hit his head hard, like a concussion, hard on a pavement. Um, and it was just a very hard adjustment. Um, and I remember just waking up each day and thinking, God, like we need you so much. And, but sometimes we just, you know, you'd wake up and it would just get worse. Um, anyway, I, I had made the room, I tried to make the room pretty for Tom for his, his time out. And, um, a friend from our life group had given me this um, wooden plaque before I left. And um, the psalm, Psalm 27, verse 13 to 14. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. I feel like we've done a lot of waiting on the Lord in our time. Um, but when I look back, often I don't see God at the time, but then I look back and I'm like, wow, he was so faithful in his provision. Um, faithful in the people he surrounded us with. And yeah, in the small detail, details and the messages from friends that encouraged me. Yeah. Coming home. Oh. Um, we came back home to Zim and it was just amazing to be back together as a family and yeah another provision of the Lord we had really prayed for Tom to be um, home in time for James's birthday and he was thanks Megster. so Meg and I 
I have always really enjoyed holidaying and it was one of the many things that we had hoped that we would be able to do. Uh, this is how our holidays look these days. Meg pretty much does everything and I observe and issue directions and our kids just enjoy the ride. It's extremely different to our previous holidays, which we highly valued, but even among the differences, we have so enjoyed being able to get out. Uh, we've done some fantastic adventures and peeps have carried me up hills, two waterfalls, it's been quite an adventure. Camping was like the end goal and uh, we've managed to, we've probably overcompensated, I think we've done quite a few big trips now, um, but it's been really cool to be able to get in the bush. I always feel like God's such an epic creator and keeper together of everything and you just get reminded of that when you're in the bush. We're nearly done. Um, I've had some fantastic counsel over the course of my accident, I'd like to share a few quotes that I've found really profound. Uh, we had an excellent counselor in Cape Town, her name was Maureen, and during a session with Meg and I, during rehab, she said to me, Tom, you will be a burden. Just be the best burden that you can be. And that's been something that we have found so helpful. It's one of those, understand the reality and then work from there. Um, she also helped me realize that she, they, they help you write, they, you write down your life ambitions and then they say, cool, these ones you can do in a wheelchair. And actually, most of your life ambitions you can fulfill in a wheelchair, even though you think you can't. Uh, once I got home, Meg and I had coffee with Maggie Norton and she went through a whole lot of things, but it was I like a throwaway comment of hers. She said, you know, Tom, people think they'll be happy when they get healed. And for me, it was just, I mean, it was just such a, amazing truth to realize. There's so many people walking around who are not happy and it just made me realize I, I can have happiness independent of my healing. I've been to a few follow-ups with Dr. Valentine. He's a hilarious, I mean he's very competent but he's, he's a fun guy. Uh, and one of them I said to him, Valentine, I just want to get healed. You know, I'm cut full of this rehab. Um, he's a major advocate of healing. <clears throat> but he said to me, Tom, does the kingdom actually need your legs? I wanted to punch him, <coughs> but that's one of the restrictions of a wheelchair. But it's been a major encouragement for me and a challenge that um, one must just continue. So as we close, I'd like to share some things that I found really challenging. Um, I've often thought of what I would give or what I would do to be healed, and I would be tempted to say prayers like, Lord, if you heal me, I will do A, B, C, D, E, F. You know, you can just keep going because you're like, I just want to get healed. And I felt over time the Lord saying to me, Tom, if you're willing to do those things after you get healed, why not just get cracking with them before you get healed? And uh, yeah, it's been a challenge and it's something that I I've, I've, uh, would like to share. Megs and I also have been blown away by the support of our friends and family. We just had messages from everyone that we knew and from their life groups and their life groups' relatives, it was crazy. And people have been praying for me, some people pray for me every day still. I think it's so cool and I'm so grateful. Um, yeah, but throughout my rehab process, I was amazed by how many broken people I met. One thing a wheelchair really does do is open the door to conversations. And I was fascinated by how spiritually broken everyone in the nursing section was. I'm very grateful for all the prayers for my physical brokenness, but I've become so challenged that there's so many people walking around that are spiritually broken and in need of the prayer and support that I've received. If we really believe the gospel, being physically broken in this world is actually inconsequential compared to being spiritually broken. Do you mind reading for me, Megs? Romans 8 verse 18. For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And I used to think, if I really believe this is true, then I would choose this accident over losing my salvation. I believe that irrespective of my view, God will still be God, and I find this super annoying sometimes. But He is just God, and He's the potter and we the clay, and it's difficult to get our heads around that, and it's, like I said, frustrating at times. But even if we find it frustrating, He's still God. And... Um, yeah, it's flipping difficult, but I still do believe that this is true. So, what do you really believe? Personally, I'm totally convinced that God created the world, 
that he created me and he created the spinal cord and that he's totally capable of healing me of it instantly. But I have decided to choose him over the healing and if he does not heal me, I probably won't understand why, but I will continue to trust and serve him and Meg's now on the same page there. It is still flipping hard. But I believe that at the end of the day, what we really need is an actual legit relationship with God. Ultimately, nothing else matters. That's it.